Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the second of our trilogy with Dr. Sigrid V. Carlson. And this one, under the title of Screening Prevention of Prostate Cancer 2021, Sigrid's going to talk with us specifically about who needs a biopsy. Hello, my name is Sigrid Carlson, and I'm an assistant attending epidemiologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And this is the second part in our Platinum Lecture Trilogy on Screening and Prevention of Prostate Cancer 2021. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Dave Crawford um, for this opportunity to give this talk for Grand Round Serology. So the second part is about who needs a prostate biopsy. And in the first part, we covered PSA testing and the evidence for, for PSA screening. So really to um, balance the benefits between uh, the benefits and harms of screening, we came up with these five golden rules. So let's go through them one and one. The first rule is get consent and engage in shared decision-making. So really this is the first start. Uh, there are some men uh, who have their PSA and, and blood drawn without even knowing about it. So that's a, that's a no starter. And the question is then how should you do this shared decision-making? Well. Um, we, ask, we ask the same question, and there are a couple of decision aids out there to use. Uh, the problems that we found when reviewing 21 of those is that a lot of them had a very high literacy level, and they contained a large number of numerical and questionable estimates. So they were conflicting or debatable estimates, and they differed between different decision aids. A lot of the decision aids also failed to highlight the role of patient choices. So for example, choosing active surveillance for low risk prostate cancer is one way of um, reducing the harms of screening and helping to modify the outcomes of screening. So this is an open question, uh, how to do shared decision-making, but I think all guidelines uh, agree that this is something that should be done in primary care. The second rule is don't screen men who won't benefit. So who are they? Well, we know that if you continue to screen older men um, at age 70, there is a, a large risk of overdiagnosis. So stopping at 70 can reduce overdiagnosis by about 42%. So don't screen older men and don't screen those with a short life expectancy. But then uh, David Crawford and I and some colleagues had a discussion about this, you know, should you really stop at 70 or is it too early for some? And then we coined this term PSA surveillance in the septuagenarian. So really it's not screening anymore, but it could be value of following the PSA test for, for in some cases. So this PSA surveillance can continue as long as the man has a sufficient life expectancy to benefit from treatment. And that should not be based on chronologic age, but physiologic assessment of life expectancy. The third golden rule is don't biopsy unless you have a compelling reason. And we want to avoid putting needles in men's prostates because of the risk of complications and in infectious complications and hospitalization. So this is really what we want to avoid. And how should we do this? When um, people all around the world, researchers, clinicians are trying to figure out uh, the logical flow for this in clinic. So you start with some sort of suspicion of prostate cancer, either elevated PSA or abnormal DRE, and then you move on to some type of positional risk stratification, whether it's biomarkers, risk calculators, MRI, or a combination thereof. And then you determine the, those who will need a prostate biopsy. And then if they have cancer or no cancer, you manage them accordingly. And active surveillance for low risk cancer is an important part of of screening and early detection. So what are our options? Well, we could always send the patient home and do nothing. We could uh, refer them to a risk calculator online. We could draw a blood test. We can have them uh, leave a urine test. There is now the MRI or combinations thereof. So it used to be easy in the late uh, 80s, 90s. We only had the PSA test, but now we have a full plethora of options. We have risk calculators, blood tests, urine tests, uh, uh, MRI, and so on. So uh, there's a lot of research going on in this field on, on how to best combine this marker and what strategies to use and which sequence to use the tests and imaging in. And the new kid on the block is really the MRI. 
And this will be covered uh, in part three because there has been so much about MRI in recent years that it uh, deserves its own part in this trilogy. So a very easy thing to do to start this risk stratification when you have a suspicion of prostate cancer is to just repeat the PSA. Because we know from this landmark study by Dr. Isam in JAMA that a lot of men have a PSA that is elevated, but will then go on to become normal when you repeat the test. So uh, a, a very simple principle is to repeat the PSA a few weeks later after the first elevation to confirm that it is still elevated because it could be transient. Then we have risk calculators. So for example, the PCPT or the USBC risk calculator. So you can go online and type in uh, the, the factors that you know and determine your risk of high-grade cancer on biopsy. It's important to remember, though, that these risk calculators um, uh, depend on the population and the, the country in which they were developed, so they might not always be calibrated to, to all situations. And then we have different biomarkers, so we know that the PSA test it is not just you know, one um, protein, but there are many molecular subforms of PSA. So you have uh, tests that are based on, on this, um, um, these, uh, this knowledge. So you have the percent free PSA, PSA, you have the prostate health index, you have the 4K score and Stockholm 3 and, and other tests that are based on, on, on this knowledge. Then we have uh, the EAU guidelines um, 2021 that now recommends um, risk calculators and imaging and then consideration of additional markers before biopsy. So the EAU recommends using PSA density. So that's taking into account PSA in relation to process volume. Uh, you could also use PSA velocity or doubling time according to the EAU, although this is less often used in the screening setting and more in the treatment setting. Um, you have the free to total ratio, you have the blood based biomarkers, PHI, 4K score, ISO PSA, and then you have urine biomarkers, PCA3, select MDX, MIPS, and ExoDX. And I won't go into these tests in more detail. This would require a talk in and of itself, but these are recommended by the EAU guidelines. And the NCCN guidelines similarly recommends performing a workup before biopsy. And that could include MRI if it's available or biomarkers that improve the specificity of PSA. And the NCCM recommends, uh, similar to the EAU, um, free PSA, PHI, select MDX, 4K score, XODX. And then in the post biopsy settings, so those who previously had a biopsy, uh, again, free PSA, 4K score, PHI, PCA3, or confirm MDX. So when not to biopsy, uh, this will be covered in Trilogy Part 3, and this was also the topic of a recent PhD thesis by Dr. Kimia Kowestani in Gothenburg, and she had these nice figures uh, and photos of this apple with the um, prostate biopsy needles, and as you can see, um, the standard has been to do the systematic random biopsies, and we still do them, but now there is this shift towards um, MRI and then only doing targeted biopsies or combining the targeted with the systematic or in some cases not doing biopsies at all. So we'll go through that in part three. Moving on to the golden rules, number four is don't treat low risk disease. And we know that active surveillance used to be only around 10% for low risk disease in the US for the last two decades. And now in recent years, we see an increase in active surveillance uh, up to 55%, which is now on the rise. And we know from our own studies of our active surveillance series at Memorial Sloan Kettering and other centers that active surveillance is a safe strategy over longer follow-up for appropriately selected patients with grade group one prostate cancer who are following a well-defined monitoring plan. And in our series, we had a low risk of distant metastases at 0.6% of at 10 years. And about half of these men remained treated treatment-free over the follow-up. And finally, the fifth golden rule, if you have to treat, refer men to a high volume provider. And we know that prostate cancer treatments can affect um, several domains of a man's life that affects his quality of life. So sexual, urinary, bowel function, hormone function, and so on. So 
uh, these treatments, uh, surgery, radiation, etc., uh, can all affect um, these important functions. And we know that whose hands perform the radical prostatectomy, so the surgery, can have a significant impact on both oncologic and functional outcomes. And you see here in this figure to the left, you have um, one surgeon is a bubble, and the size of the bubble is proportional to the number of surgeries that he or she performs. And you can see that the larger bubbles have better outcomes, both in terms of oncologic outcomes and functional outcomes. To the, in the figure to the right, you see the learning curve for, for open prostatectomy, and you can see that it takes a fair amount of um, surgeries before a surgeon can really master the procedure. So in this case, around 250 cases. And in a recent study from Sweden, from the LAPRO trial, we showed that there is really a large heterogeneity among surgeons for both these oncologic and functional outcomes. So while this study was originally meant to compare open and robotic surgery, really what this study is showing is that um, the surgeon really affects um, outcomes. So um, the difference in surgeon volume could explain a large proportion of this heterogeneity, both for urinary incontinence, erectile dysfunction, and recurrence. So when you take surgeon volume into account, when you compare open versus robotic surgery, you really have significant impact on the results. So that was all for part two and moving into part three, we will discuss the, the value of incorporating MRI in early detection. Thank you.